Chip. I, I'm going to miss that theme song. The first week they started playing it, I thought they started playing Love Train by the OJs. I thought it was just going out, fall out, dance party. But, but I'm excited to be able to share with you today. And if you're joining us online, I'm glad you're with us as well. And today we're wrapping up our series, The Art of Destroying Relationships. Now, if you haven't caught on, we've been using a little bit of sarcasm as we discuss the topics of how to push people away or how to ruin romance. And today, I have the privilege of addressing the topic, how to really mess up your kids. Now, parents, aren't you glad you came today to find out how to really mess up your kids? And some of you may be tuning out right about now. You, you may be saying, hey, this, this message isn't going to apply to me. My kids are all grown or... I don't have kids or I don't want kids, but I want you to know that not every message is always about you at this present time, but it may apply to you one day, and it may be that God just has you here so you can take what you learn and take it and share it with someone else. So I want you to take your Bibles and, or your phone app or whatever you use and, and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll see exactly what God has to say about child-parent relationships. Now, I know that all of you aren't parents today, and, but you have to realize that you are all someone's child. And if not anything, hopefully, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're God's child. And so there'll be things that we'll be talking about today that you'll be able to apply to yourself as a child of God as well. In Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 1, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he's writing this letter to the church, and he includes the, the children. Children aren't just the church of the future. They're the church of today. Amen? And this is what he says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. And so why is today's topic so important? Why is it so important that we talk about parental child relationships? Well, a Pew Research study shows that 40% of US children under the age of 18 lack a strong emotional bond to their parents. And some of the biggest culprits that they list out as damaging these relationships are three things. Number one, over-controlling parents. Number two, permissive parents. And then three, neglectful parents. And in fact, I don't know if you know, some of you old-timers might know this group. It's a group called the Cowsills. They were real popular in uh, probably the mid-60s. I remember hearing them on, uh, on, on the oldie station when I was growing up. But anyways, uh, they, they had at one point, they had a number one single, and uh, they had like five songs in the top 10 over, over the course of their short career. And the thing that destroyed them was their father, Bud Cowsill. And in fact, it, it was four brothers that got together and they started a rock and roll band and uh, they wanted to be like the Beatles. And as they started growing and got popular, the, their producer and everything said, no, you need to put your mom in the band and your little sister. Can you imagine how terrible that is to put your mom and your little sister in the band. In fact, some of you might have remember if you saw Nick at Night or something, the TV show The Partridge Family. Well, that was based on their family. And, um, but their father destroyed them and destroyed their whole career. He was a Navy man, and he was a strong Navy man, and so he tried to run his house like he would run in the Navy. And he would just try to have strict control over their kids. He was also an alcoholic, also very abusive. And he just had this hovering uh, presence over them all the time, and they ended up just kind of imploding. And in fact, they were supposed to be on the Ed Sullivan show for like five appearances, only made it to one, I think, because of the dad and how he treated everybody. But when we think about that, it's so easy to, to really mess up our kids. And most of what we are going to discuss today is really kind of on the surface. If you want more, sign up for Pastor Joe and Amy's uh, family roadmap on March 16th. But we've also been looking during this study, the art of destroying relationships. We've always been going back to Philippians chapter 2. And in verses 3 and 4, it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, 
But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not on your own interest, but also the interest of others. And so this verse applies to our church relationship. It applies to our personal relationships, our family relationships, the relationship we have with our spouse, and it even includes the relationships that you have with your children as well. And the one thing that I want you to take from this message today is this, children are a gift to be cultivated, not an annoyance to be controlled. So often I think parents are more focused on the controlling aspect that they neglect the cultivation process. And that's easy to do, but if you do that, you're gonna really mess up your kids. And I am sure by now that you've all seen this Bible verse. How, how many of you have seen this Bible verse? It's found in John 10.10. 10. I came that they may have life and they may have it abundantly. You ever see that verse? It's on the wall, right? When you come in, everyone has seen that verse. But do you know how that verse begins? It begins with the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And Satan is the thief that wants to steal, kill, and destroy our personal relationships, our romantic relationships, and he even wants to destroy the relationships that we have with our children. And we have to understand that all our relationships and the struggles we have is really a spiritual battle. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this, over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And we need to see that it's all a spiritual battle. And Satan has been great at whispering his serpent lies in our ears all the way back since page two of the Bible. And when it comes to raising our children, we can either listen to those serpent lies that will destroy our relationships and mess up our children, or we could just simply listen to the voice of God. So what are some of the serpent lies the enemy whispers to us in order to steal, kill, and destroy or mess up our children? And I gotta say, there are many, but I wanna focus on just three of them today. And these lies will not only destroy your relationship with your child, but it could really mess them up. The first lie that he whispers in your ear is this. Make your kids obey you no matter what it takes. A after all, you don't want to be looked at as a bad parent. You know, when you're out in public, you don't want to be embarrassed. You want people to see you as a good parent. You want to see that you have good kids. And we've all been out in public somewhere where we either have seen children who are acting unruly or, or parents that are having a meltdown because of the way that their kids are acting or parents that are just sitting there th and you're thinking, why aren't they doing anything? You see, but the thing is, is that there's more to obedience than just simply towing the line. And that's what we want to instill in our children, that there's more than just following my commands. You know, when I grew up and my dad told me to do some, his reply was, because I said so. <laughs> and, 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 and that was good to a point, but then I wanted to know, why are you saying so? And so when I think of all the things that the Bible speaks about obedience, if I have to just put it in just one definition, I would say that this is probably the best definition of obedience ever. And this is it. Obedience is doing what I'm told to do, when I'm told to do it, with the right heart attitude. Now that doesn't just apply to your kids, that implies you too. It goes for you and your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you just don't want your kids to look like they're obeying. You want them to learn the importance of obedience and then have a desire to obey you. Teaching children to want to obey is much more important than teaching them to look like they're obeying. And so while children need to be disciplined, there's a fine line between disciplining out of a place of anger and frustration and lovingly shepherding your child's heart. And so if you want to cultivate your child, you need to discipline them out of love. And you need to teach them the proper behavior. If you want to mess up your child, you just use punishment as a fear to make them conform to the behavior that you desire. In fact, we read at the end of the passage in Ephesians 6, 4, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, 
but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. And so when you discipline children, you want to break their selfish will, but you don't want to break their spirit. And in fact, Paul also wrote, and he warns us, and this is from the message, I love how it's worded. Parents, don't come down too hard on your children or you'll crush their spirit. This means when you discipline your child, you need to do it out of a love for your children, not out of anger and frustration. And, and for myself, when there were times where I had to discipline my children and I needed to take a time out before I went and disciplined them. And so loving discipline is looking out for the interest of the child. Disciplining in anger is just looking out for your own personal interests. Once again, children are a gift to be cultivated, not an annoyance to be controlled. And I'll be honest that there were times as a young parent that I disciplined my children out of anger rather than loving discipline. The one that just sticks out to me was I think Stephanie, my Stephanie was only about three years old and, and uh, Cindy and I just got a new Mazda. It was probably about three years old, but it was new to me. I mean, it, it was a sharp car. I loved it. it. It was the newest car I ever owned in my life. And we were going on vacation. We stopped at a rest stop and we filled up with gas and, and we got some snacks and I got a a pop and I took a sip out of it and Stephanie's in the back in her car seat and she asked for a pop and so I, I handed it to her and she took a sip and I, I went to grab it from her and I see her holding it and she's looking at the seat and she just does this. <laughs> My Mazda! I pulled over real quick. I got around the car. I opened the car door. I'm thankful she had a diaper on at this time. And I, I took her out of her car seat, and I gave her a little whack, and I cleaned it up, and, and I just got back in the car. And man, did the, the Spirit of God come upon me and said, you're, you're, you're an idiot. That's not how you do this. And, you know, thankfully over time, I learned not to discipline my children over childish behavior meaning when kids are just acting like kids. I mean, I'm, I needed to teach her that, hey, you don't pour pop on the seat, but that wasn't the way to do it. But I only would discipline my children over time over open defiance. You ever see that? When they're younger and you tell them, hey, don't touch something, and they look you in the eye and they go, boink. <laughs> that, that would bring discipline. Outright rebellion or sinful action, lying or stealing. And, and to be honest, this is why I love being a grandparent, because you get a do-over and correct all the mistakes you made the first time. My, my, my kids don't even know who I am half the time. Like, who are you? <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, that isn't how you treated us. Well, no, my grandkids are special. I mean, grandkids, aren't they special? I mean, Joan's nodding with me. I mean, if I could, I would have had my grandkids first, you know? I mean, they're awesome. But if you are truly a child of God, your heavenly father does the same thing for you when you're defiant, when you're disobedient, or when you rebel against him. You see, when, when you are a Christian, when you are a child of God, God doesn't punish you because Jesus Christ took the punishment for our sin on the cross, amen? But he lovingly disciplines you in order to, what, to train you and to motivate you to change your behavior and to live a holy life. And in fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, he says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. You see, when God disciplines his children, it serves as proof, number one, that we are his child, but it also reminds us that he loves us. And the same should be true when you discipline your children. It should serve as proof that you love them. You want the best for them. You want them to live a good life. You see, loving discipline isn't an option. Years ago, when I would uh, run camps, we always had that one kid at camp that was always trouble. And it was always that kid's parents that would come to me and they would talk to me and they would say, you know, we don't believe in spanking our child. And I would just say, oh, really? <laughs> I found that out every day your child was here. I didn't say that, but I was thinking that. 
But loving discipline is commanded. Here, here, here's a pop quiz for you all. Let, let, let's fill in the blank. Spare the rod. Let's say it again. Spare the rod. You're all wrong. <laughs> because that's not what the Bible says. This saying is taken from Proverbs 13, 24. Listen to what it says. Whoever spares the rod hates his son. But he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. You see, God disciplines us because he loves us. And you are to discipline your children because you love them, not because you just want to control them. You see, the word diligent in Proverbs 13 carries the idea of doing a thorough job, of doing it carefully, consistently, and thoroughly. And the idea behind discipline is to change the child's behavior, not simply punish them for what they've done. And I want to tell you, ch child discipline is probably the least enjoyable part of parenting. It can be frustrating. It can be discouraging. It can be exhausting. But loving discipline is the best way to cultivate your children. If you don't cultivate them, you will mess them up and they will end up controlling you. In Hebrews 12, 10, it says, God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. And so God disciplines you so you will change your behavior, you will do the right thing for the right reason. It's true that God loves you the way you are, but you wanna know something? God loves you too much to let you stay that way. I love my children the way they were, but I love them too much to let them continue down that path. I wanted to see them grow. And you want your child to get beyond the point of where they say, I got to, to the point they say, I want to. And obey you out of love and trust as their parent, not fear of control. How many of you are familiar with the phrase, no pain, no gain? You know, people always use that in context of going to the gym. And I hate when people say that because to, to me, when, every time someone says that to me, they, they sound like Rocky Balboa, you know? No pain, no gain. Hey, Adrian, you know? And uh, yeah, you know, no pain, no gain. And, and you can tell by my bulging biceps that I believe no pain, no pain. You know? In fact, no, no, all joking aside, I do resistance training. I refuse to go to the gym. But when you, when you properly discipline your child, there's going to be pain and there's going to be gain. In, in the short term result, there is some pain, but the long term result is gain. In Hebrews 12 11, it says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The psalmist said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. And so if you lovingly discipline your child, they'll more likely respect you and you'll continue to have a good relationship with them. If you just do whatever it takes to control your child, to get them to conform so they don't embarrass you, that control is going to lead to resentment. That control is gonna break down your relationship. And it doesn't work in the long run. You'll just mess them up. Cultivation brings about a lifelong change is what you are striving for. And it allows for your relationship to flourish. If you want to mess up any relationship, just try to control the other person. It just doesn't work. And so what's the first lie? Make your child obey no matter what it takes. The second lie is this. Protect them from harm at all cost. While it is your responsibility to protect your children, some parents do this to the extreme. Have you ever heard of the term helicopter parent? If you're Jewish, they're called smothers. Any of you guilty of this? Yeah, all the parents saying no, kids are going yes, yes. You see, these parents are 
always around trying to protect your child, not wanting them to get hurt or fail in any way. And to be honest, this really doesn't help the child. Rather, it exasperates them. And it can damage your relationship. That's what Ephesians 6.4 says, provoking your child to anger. I have seen children being smothered so much by their helicopter parents that when they get older, they leave home and they just never look back. I, I've seen children who have moved away and could care less that they ever saw their parents again. And I've seen these same parents weep because their children would not allow them to see their grandchildren. I personally know a woman, she is home with the Lord now, but was smothered so much by her mother and her father that when she grew up, she, it turned into just full-blown phobias that she had to deal with. Now, the wisest, smartest pastor I know, he's even a good-looking pastor, probably the best pet look, good-looking pastor I know, said this. The ultimate goal of Christian parents is to guide your children to a saving faith in Jesus Christ and to set them on a path to independence by becoming full functioning mature adults to the glory of God. You know which pastor said that? Right here. We got a picture of him. Oh. Yeah. Is there a picture? It's supposed to be a beautiful picture of me up there, but anyways. You didn't think I was talking about Pastor Aaron, did you? Probably not. But anyways, pain, hurt, and disappointment are all part of life. Uh, and those are the things that God uses to mold us into his image. Uh, in our Christian school, uh, the fourth grade teacher would always do uh, a section on butterflies every year. And, and, uh, and I, I didn't know you could do this. You can order uh, the little uh, pupas or larvae through the mail, and they come, and, and we always get this little box that was kind of wiggling inside, and, and, that, and she would be so excited. That's her little, uh, little larva, and the kids would get these little tiny little bottles, and they would put it in, and they would put some stuff in there to kind of nourish it, and then when it got ready, they would, uh, it, it would build a chrysalis, and then they would tape it to the inside of the box, and, and they would have to log every day. They would go and log and see how their butterflies do, and they're all numbered, and and then the big day comes when, the, when, when they're coming out of their chrysalises. And, and you know, they just kind of break open and then there's a lot of wiggling and uh, struggling that's going on. And there, there were some kids that just couldn't stand to watch their little butterfly struggle and they just wanted to see it come out. And so when the teacher wasn't looking, they would reach in and kind of help, help it pull it out. And, and the thing is, is that butterflies need all that wiggling and flapping and struggling uh, because what it does is it gets the blood to their wings and it unfolds and it makes them a, a butter, beautiful butterfly. And then if you helped it, you, d you didn't have a butterfly, you had a butter walk. I mean, that's all the thing would do. It, I mean, it was messed up. But you know what? You do the same thing when you bail out your children, when you hover over them, when you're always there and you're helping them out and you're not letting them learn from life. It causes more harm than good. And children are going to need fully functioning wings if you expect them to fly one day. And you don't want to mess them up. And so sometimes in protecting their children at all costs, parents do not even let them face the consequences to their own actions. There's a biblical principle called reaping what you sow. It's found in Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. And part of that reaping process is God's way of disciplining us and helping us to learn and change our behavior. And reaping can be hard at times. It can be difficult at times. I have seen many parents try to intervene for their children so that they will not have to face the consequences to their actions. There were times where, where I saw kids that would miss a field trip and then the, because of how they were behaving. And uh, the parents would come in and argue with the teacher or children would get a, a lower grade because they didn't hand in an assignment or they failed a test. And the parents would come in. I've seen that in elementary school. I've seen it in our junior high and high school. And we had one of our 
uh, our high school principals at one time. He, uh, he got a job. He was going to Cedarville College to teach. And one of the things he said to me, he goes, man, Don, he goes, I, I am going to be so happy. I'm not going to have to deal with all these parents about their kids' grades. And I saw him like a year later. I said, Bill, how's it going? I, you, you, you miss all the phone calls from parents? He goes, they're worse. He goes, when they're paying college tuition, it's worse. But that messes the kids up. You know, you can be their teacher or you have to let life be their teacher. And, and life isn't a merciful teacher, but it helps. But you know what? So what are the lies again? Lie number one, make your kids obey you no matter what it takes. Lie number two, protect them from harm at all cost, and then line number three is this. Don't let them disrupt the things that are important to you. You know, we live in a, a culture where many look at children as a disruption rather than a blessing. That somehow children will keep people from pursuing their goals and dreams or, or even having any fun in life. You, you maybe have heard this term, but it's a term called DINKS. Anybody ever hear of the term DINKS? It stands for dual income with no kids. Now, some are DINKS because they're just not ready to have kids. Some are DINKS, dual income, no kids, because, uh, you know, they can't have children. But on the Internet, when you see a lot of these DINKS, it's, it's a mindset. It's a mindset that kids are kind of a punishment on life. It keeps me from doing this or that. It keeps me from having the fun that I want. It keeps me from doing the things that I want. And I think it's a terrible mindset because no kid is an inconvenience. You know, children are a blessing from the Lord, not a disruption. And I think that at Fellowship City, we are blessed. When I look around here and I see all the kids today that are in our children's department, when I see all the kids at Orange and Hudson, we are blessed to have these kids around. But they're not an inconvenience, and we, we have to be careful we don't ever let them feel that way. And so this is a plug for Allison. Sign up to help in the kids' department. Let them know they're important. When you go out and you greet the parents, talk to the kids as well. Greet them. Because children are a blessing. They're not a disruption or inconvenience. And if you would allow me just to stand on a, my soapbox for just a few minutes, it, it breaks this father's heart. And it breaks the heart of my Heavenly Father to think about the hundreds of thousands of unborn babies that have been sacrificed in abortion clinics around our country and around the world, all in the name to the God of convenience. All because people see children as, as a form of a disruption to their goals, to their careers, or their lifestyle. Does having kids change your life? Yes, it changes your life. Do your priorities need to change after you have kids? Absolutely. Does life get more complicated? Most definitely. But God has blessed us with a gift, and you are now stewards of that gift, and God wants you to cultivate it, to cultivate that gift, to make it a fully functioning adult to the glory of God. Psalm 127, 3 and 4 says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. God calls kids a gift. He calls them a reward. And if you're able to have children of your own, consider yourself blessed. There are many who are unable to have kids on their own. But children are never, ever an inconvenience. They're never a disruption. Children are a gift from the Lord. Philippians 2 is very clear when we're told do nothing from what? Selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. That means you gotta spend time with your kids, spend time with your child doing something that maybe they enjoy and, and having to sacrifice something you personally enjoy or you feel you need. You know, when, when I was growing up, we had uh, six in our family. I have uh, 
a, a brother and two sisters and my mom and dad. And uh, I remember, you know, we, we didn't have a lot growing up. My mom would just make, I remember some Sundays we would have a chicken. And uh, being the youngest, I got a leg. My sister got a leg. My dad got a breast. And I think my older brother and sister got thighs and stuff. And, and um, my mom always said, I, I, I just want the wings. I just want the wings. And for years, I thought my mom loved chicken wings until my dad said, no, mom just ate the chicken wings so you guys could have the better pieces. You know, it... She didn't look at us as an inconvenience. She looked at us as something that needed to be cultivated, and she was willing to sacrifice for her children. But yet, we have parents today who can't even spend time with their kids because maybe there's a big game on the TV. Or I, I'm scrolling in my phone. You could be present and not actually be there. You know that, right? And, uh, you know, I, and I've always made it a thing that if, if I'm on my phone and, and uh, my children come, my grandkids come, I set it down. If the TV's on and they want to talk to me, I'll, I'll mute it. Even if it's right at a pivotal point in the game or, or right when the story on the, of the movie is getting you know, good, I want to find out who did this murder or whatever. I, I'll, I'll mute it, pause it if I have to. But then I think, you know, hey, they're more important to me. And I do that through my actions. So don't be distracted. Don't be on your tablet. Don't be on your phone when your kids are there. Young parents, understand this. Your children will never be the age they are today. Enjoy them, because it goes fast. If you look at your child as an interruption, or if they even perceive that they are an interruption, it will kill your relationship. It can mess up your children. And it could even bleed into the future. Proverbs 29, 15 says, a child left to himself becomes shame to his mother. No one starts off parenthood in, in the hospital holding that little baby and saying, man, I'm going to really mess you up. <laughs> you have big dreams from the moment you start touching your kids and seeing them. And you know what? No one ever said, man, I wish I spent more time at the office on their dead bed, that deathbed. And spending time with your kids is more than you having the latest toys or them having the latest toys. For them being on the best sports team or having the biggest house on the street. Children just need to spend time with you. And you say, well, I don't spend a lot of quantity time. I just spend quality time. And let me just say this, you, you can't truly have quality without quantity. Quality and quantity, they go hand in hand. And so once you recognize that children are a gift from the Lord, and we're only stewards of those gifts, and we see them as something to be cultivated rather than controlled, it changes your whole life. And the cultivation process is an ongoing process. As your child grows, your role as a parent changes. You start off as the caregiver. They can't do anything for themselves. Then you're the cop. Don't do this. You'll get hurt. Don't go there. Then you start giving them a little more freedom, and, and you let them out on the field, and you're their coach. You just coach them from the sidelines. And when they go astray, do something wrong, you, you tell them. Then when they get older, you're their consultant. Kids need their parents more the older they get. And perhaps you're here today and you're guilty of some of the things that we discussed this morning. I want you to know this. It's never too late to change. It's never too late to go to your child, to ask them for forgiveness and say, hey, I messed up. Don't make any excuses. Just admit your guilt to them and do what's needed to, to, to change and mend that broken relationship. And I want you to know this. God is always able to fix the things that we think we messed up beyond repair. And perhaps you're the child and you're carrying some bitter wounds around because of what your parents have done to you. You need to forgive them from your heart so that you could be in a place where healing can begin and restoration can take place. If you have good kids as a parent, praise the Lord, tell them that. If you're a child and you have great parents, praise the Lord, tell them that. Tell them that you appreciate them. Parents, you need to stop listening to Satan's lies and start listening to that still small voice of the Holy Spirit. 
praying to God and asking him to help you cultivate your children in such a way that they will one day be controlled by the Holy Spirit. When a child knows he's loved, they will obey you not because they have to, because they want to. We're naturally good at destroying relationships. So now, now let's live supernaturally through the power of the Holy Spirit and strive to build great relationships with one another, with our spouse and our family, and with our kids. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for loving us. So we thank you for Jesus who makes it all possible. Lord, we know we are in that, that we are not perfect. We're just sinful people trying to raise kids. And you know that. You know everything about us. So Lord, I'm just thankful that you are always there to help us, to guide us, to instill in us what's right. And Lord, if there's someone here who has a broken relationship with their child or their parent, convict them now, Lord. Let them do what's needed to get it right. Uh, I was just, I was caught, um, you know, knowing what culture says to us as parents, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters, as people who who walk with kids, and I'm, I'm constantly remember, reminded of what culture is telling us, and I'm reminded that if, if we do the same thing the same way, we get the same results. And so what I love about what we heard is this is God's word. Let's do something different than what the culture teaches. Let's, let's do what we have been called to, which is to live our life according to the word of God. Maybe you're here today and you just need some prayer. Our prayer team's going to be up here in front. And they'd love to come. If you just come on down, they would love to just spend some time and, and pray with you. Maybe you're uh, just got something heavy. You just come down and pray with them. Heavenly Father, I pray right now for each and every one of us as we look at our lives, as we look at our families, as we look at what you've called us to. God, help us. Help the things that we've talked about today to uh, sink into our hearts, to leave this place with us and enter into our homes. Help our kids, grandkids, nieces and nephews feel that they're the blessing that they are. God, help this place to be different than what the culture says. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, as we finish up here today, I've got just a couple announcements. First of all, uh, immediately following the service, we have Meet Fellowship. Maybe you've been uh, coming here just for maybe just the last few weeks and you want to get a chance to get to know some of the staff here, some of those who are uh, up here on stage who are our pastors and elders. As you walk out, we have Meet Fellowship right outside the doors here. We would love to get a chance to get to know you just a little bit more as well as I uh, want to remind you that next week, I want to invite you to come back, bring somebody with you as we start our new series called Imposter Syndrome. Uh, something that we struggle with as a culture uh, very deeply. We're going to dive into that here beginning next week with imposter syndrome. See you guys next week. Hope you have an amazing week of ministry. Love you guys.